The national health care debate stirs strong feelings on all sides. So many different plans, priorities, and perceptions. And for many observers, so much confusion. This morning, a roundtable of our representatives dedicated to talking through the most divisive issue in recent memory, health care. Today is Sunday, September 6, 2009, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, and welcome to Flashpoint. My producer, Olive Hatha Cannavala, likes to kid me whenever I say this is a special edition of Flashpoint. Okay, she's right. We work to make them all special. But I think you'll agree this morning gives us a very provocative opportunity. I think even Olive would admit that. We've watched our congressmen and women fan out into their home districts to talk about health care. More than 800 turned out for Gary Peters' meeting in West Bloomfield on Tuesday of last week. But this morning, a real meeting of Michigan's Capitol Hill Mines. We have two Michigan Democrats and two Michigan Republicans. These are lawmakers who have a voice in where this enormously complex and very important initiative goes or doesn't go. In fact, some fear the Republicans have seen enough of the public's anger and the president's plummeting approval ratings and are basically ready to sit it out. Not this morning. Congressman Mike Rogers and Thaddeus McCotter are here, as are two of the most consistently ardent voices supporting universal health care, Congressman John Dingell and John Conyers. They're here all together for the full program this morning. Yes, I'll call it a very special edition of Flashpoint. It is indeed a very august group I have assembled this morning. Very happy to have with me four members of Congress, all from Southeast Michigan. John Dingell, Democrat from the 15th District, and next to him, John Conyers, Democrat from the 14th District. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. A lot of history on that side of the table. And over here on the other side are the Republicans. Mike Rogers, Republican from the 8th District, and Thad McCotter, Republican from the 11th District. I'm, I, I feel like I've stumbled into it, like I'm sneaking into a conference room in Washington. Thank you all very much for being here. I would like to start with the Republicans because, as I said at the outset, uh, Congressman Rogers, the, there is this sense that Republicans have read the, read the tea leaves, have seen uh, the distaste, the anger that we've seen break out at the town hall meetings, have decided we're going to sit this out. And uh, yet so many people say you can't possibly sit it out, yeah. whether you want the kind of change that's been debated or not, we have to have change. Uh, absolutely. And we've got a great uh, list of ideas that we think can make health care work for every single American family. Lower cost, better access, continue quality, and oh, by the way, the government won't stand between you and your doctor. The problem is we've never been involved. We've never been invited to the negotiations at the White House. We've never been involved uh, in the negotiations in the committee. And when the news re was reporting new negotiations, it was Democrats negotiating with Democrats. And my argument is that's unfortunate. I mean, this is a topic that touches every single American. There are great solutions. Let's at least have the opportunity to talk about them. And I think people would be more likely and more inclined to support those. What's that bill number? Well, there's a whole host of them, and we'd no, be happy to give them. No, the one that you're promoting. Uh, I don't have the bill, but Mr. Is Chairman, there a if, bill? If, if Mr. Chairman, if you're willing to offer a negotiation right here, right now, we'll do it. On uh, there's uh, on well, as soon expanding as you HSAs, produce a bill, we have be, a bill. We have several bills. Well, what's the number? Well, we'll get you the we'll get you the number. But there are several as, of them, and that's as, the point. As a matter of fact, my good friend Michael, there is no Republican no, that's, bill. That's not true. I love you dearly, but there's not. There, that's just, sir. That's just not true. <laughs> well, what 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 is it? It's then? a combination of a whole host of bills. Well, it's several bills. It doesn't fit on a bumper sticker that says it's you get bills. the government involved in your life, but it has a whole well, host of bills. Uh, well, High-risk pools, uh, well, look, uh, expansion, associated whenever, health plans. Whenever we all of get those through are, with are this bills. discussion, send me the numbers of the bill. I'll send you the bill. Uh, Congressman McCotter, in fact, that's been one of the criticisms, that while the Democrats may, clearly made a mistake in maybe not bringing enough Republicans into the process at the beginning, now you've been too empowered by watching the president's plummeting uh, approval ratings, by watching what's happened at the town hall meetings, that you can sit back without really feeling um, the necessity to put forth your own ideas. Well, first we come at it from, I suppose, a different point of view. People are very concerned about the cost of the health care system. But undergirding the effort that has been put forward by the majority, which can pass anything they want without a single Republican vote in the House, and until the untimely passing of Senator Kennedy, could have a filibuster-proof vote in the Senate to do it. What you're witnessing is an argument amongst the Democratic Party. And so while the Republican Party is sitting here, and we're putting forward solutions premised on increasing the supply of health care through free market forces to empower patients as consumers to meet the rising cost problem, 
The bill in front of us is really trying to reduce the supply of health care, to reduce the cost, which at a time of growing demographic demand will not work. When supply is reduced through government, when the demand increases through demographic pressures, the cost is going to go up. So as far as our concerns are, our philosophical premise is generally vastly different than the bill in front of us, which even the Democratic in, Party is debating. In fact, and as for the number, it would be the same number as the President's bill, because the President has staked out positions. And the fact that he's even talking about coming to a joint address of Congress right now to clarify and add some specifics to his position to make it appear more as a plan, would say that he's almost like where we are, I would think. Well, that's great. That, 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 that address coming this week, that, Congressman Conyers, there is some truth to what, we're, what, what he says is among the Democrats, because we are starting to see, you've got more Democrats saying, look, the public plan is not necessarily a deal breaker, but not, I believe, I believe both of you believe Trump. it is. You know, and uh, I'm happy to find out that the president's bill is the one that you're going to use, or his number. Bill. He doesn't have one. He has a position. Oh, He's I come see. H.R. 3200 <laughs> is not a bill. Are you ready to expand health bill. savings accounts and associated health plans? All the things that you've opposed in the past, those are bills. Oh, those oh are, I see. Those are ideas ready so to you expand want to, you to want to graph them onto the president's bill, and we may that's, be able to work something out. Is that the, the idea? The president's bill. The president has a position, he's allowed Congress to shape the bill. Yes. And he's coming to us, and the internal debate in the White House, as reported through the Washington Post and others, is whether he will add specifics to what he intends to see and grab control of the health care. So to say that the president oh, has put okay. forward a bill right. in which he agrees with all the provisions, I think would be unfair Look. to your president. I'd hate to do Look, that. Look, if, if, if you don't have a bill, or you've got a bunch of bills that you're going to bring us, or if you want to graft something on to H.R. 3200, that's great. The, the reason we're grateful to be here is that we're finding this out now. No, I, and that's I'll, I will simply go, not true. I will go, well, we've had Even the, we've had even the, three the dean hearings. of the house has a grin. He can't we, take off his face we with have, that one. <laughs> we have three committees working on this, gentlemen, in the house. Yeah. We have two other committees uh, working on it in the, the Senate. There are Republicans on both all five of these committees. Let, 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 let's get Are they with you on this? Or do, oh, have absolutely. they heard about this? We've, we've tried to offer these amendments. We've tried to in, enter in those negotiations, and we're not allowed to do it. Let me, let me get into some specific issues here, starting with the public option. John Dingell, well, do you see that as being a deal breaker? If there's no public option, a government option to compete with private insurers. Let's have a little history first. First of all, we had a bill. Three committees have had hearings. My good friend Mike over yonder was offering amendments, they got voted down. And remember, we campaigned on this in the last election. President Obama won on this particular issue amongst others. The bill that we have before us has been read not once, but in three committees. And my good friend over there, is, and, and both of my good friends over there are very familiar with it, been issuing statements left and right about what the bill contains. Hard fact of the matter is the bill gives free choice to Americans of health policies. It sees to it every American will be covered. It sees to it that things that are wrong with the system today are corrected. No more pre-existing conditions. No more the right of the insurance company to cancel a policy anytime it's minded. They can cancel the policy while you're on the gurney going into the, going into the operating uh, chamber. Uh, that's, that's not right. So we're going to stop that. And it's going to become a floor for the benefits rather than a but ceiling. The it's going to permit, you you no, no, let me finish. Let me, let, me, let me finish. It's going to permit choice. And it's going to see to it that the small business people who are going to be brought in are going to, first of all, not have to pay the 18% differential and get a 50% percent But Congressman, when you say it's going to preserve choice, at the very outset, the promise was that if you like the health care you have right now, you'll get to keep it. And that it, promise kind of went away in no, all this. No, it did not go away. It oh. is still there. And, it, and I challenge anybody to show me where there's anything in that bill that takes that right away from an American citizen. Well, won't I, some employers have to move to the government option no. if it becomes cheaper? No. What if they don't want to? Well, if... It, it, <laughs> the, the, I guess the, clearly then the, 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 there's, there may be a difference between an employer and an employee making that choice, obviously, but for an employee who has a plan that they the, like right now, if they watch their employer move to a government public friend, choice, they would have to as well. Let me remind you that one of the problems we've got is a million Americans are losing health care every year. There's four people every minute are losing health care, and a lot of that is, is guess why? because the employers are terminating the policies. That happened in mass 
in, my, in the supplier industry, in the steel industry, and now it's happening in the auto industry to the white collar well, workers. Before I get People to a break, should be scared Rogers, to death about the fact you, they're going to lose their you policy. Take, you take great issue with the way that we, we calculate the uninsured in this country. Well, absolutely. You think a lot of those people are uninsured by choice. Well, about, about, about 9.5 million are uninsured by choice. They, have, they, they make more than the median average in income, and they choose not to have it. Now, here's the other part. We could solve 75% of all the children in America who are uninsured today are eligible for a program but not signed up. That's about 12 million people in that uninsured number, 12 million. So when you start backing off the places that we can have an impact without the government taking it over, you get down to 7 million people who are well, that's, chronically that's uninsured. Very interesting. So I, here's I, what I, we I, need. I, I, I got to get Didn't both of you vote against SCHIP for kids? No, I voted no, no. for it this time. Oh, oh, this time. <laughs> what about four, you? Because of four million I, job loss. What about the, you? I, I voted for allowing illegal immigrants. I got to get to a break. We'll continue with this joint session of Congress on Flashpoint right after this. Don't go away. Welcome back, Flashpoint. In the break, uh, Congressman Conyers suggests this this committee needs a chairman. I need a gavel. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> uh, the, the, Congressman McCotter, let me start with you. The, the, the broader foundations upon which Congressman Dingell just built uh, what he believes the program should be built on, do you have problems with those, the fundamental issues that need to be in place here, uh, pre-existing conditions, everybody being entitled to, uh, to, to care, where you, you can't have it changed at the last minute, on and on. Are there some right. fundamentals that you agree on? Right, and we want to make sure that a lot of these problems are dealt with, but it's a question of how they're dealt with. Does the government then become the one that makes these determinations for you as opposed to an insurance company? Because as, as the chairman pointed out, there may not be a provision in the bill that says you will never, we will strip your health care away from you. But there's also not a provision that prevents it, that can stop an employer from dumping you into the system. And precisely because of the people we're talking about, the supply chain getting hurt, the auto industry getting hurt, white collar people losing their health care because it's too expensive or the employer will drop them due to difficulties. What we want to do is expand the supply of health care through market forces, empower them as consumers to deal with this, as opposed to having the government set up in a position whereby it becomes much more economically uh, incentivized for employers to put their employees into this system. Well, so that's why you oppose a public option. The public option, as, right? Barney, as Chairman Barney Frank has said, is a step to single payer, which makes government the only option. So that's why no, you oppose that is, a, that is specifically not so. It is what the and he did not say that. Past, no, what no, Barney no. said in no, the past, no, no. this bill is a step no, no, no. in the, the right direction. No, no, no. The public option well, is entirely the public option is entirely voluntary, and CBO says it's only going to cover about three percent of the people. You don't have to go in if you don't want. The employer doesn't have to go into it. Many employers can't go into it <clears throat> because they're too big. Yeah. Small employers can't. Look, friends, it's okay yeah, to come right. out against the public option on television. It's all right. <laughs> You're against the public option. Well, in fact, let me ask you both. Yeah. Is, the, the is, there, plan is, is it a deal, is it a deal breaker? Option. Can you Absolutely. see? And you're for it. Unfortunately, let me ask both the, the, only bipart the only bipartisan votes in the House, the unprecedented agreement, has been bipartisan opposition to this bill. Is that a deal breaker or can you see a construct of a public plan? Because at the heart of it, uh, the idea behind a public plan to create competition against which finally private insurers would have some, uh, uh, would have, uh, there would be leverage in the system, that's kind of the bedrock, I think, for a lot of the, the Democrats who first proposed this plan. Can, I, I, is that the deal breaker or can you see an option where a government plan is acceptable, would the, be acceptable the, the to The premise of that is wrong. If you want to fix competition with insurance companies, we can do that associated health plans allowing them to compete across state lines they can these are do things that that now. no that is not true that is true that is absolutely and not and true. there are Aren't employers the in there are employers yeah. in michigan now who are doing that right the now the cars with dingle with i that's think that's true. been a complaint from uh, 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 <laughs> an assumption almost that one of the problems in the system is that insurers can't compete across state lines well and and i've i've offered legislation over the years to see to it that we would have federal regulations so that they could move across state lines. The harsh fact of the matter is you cannot regulate insurance companies on the state level. The hard fact of the matter is that there's all manner of rascality and dishonesty going on there because of that fact. And the worst fact of, the, of this whole situation is that 
the, the people are being hurt by this situation. The public plan is to give them competition. The only regulation that you can get is competition. And the reason is that the only thing the states can do to control prices or to control anything else is to regulate on the basis of solvency. And that doesn't but, deal with protecting but, the rights of the patient, and it doesn't deal with the protecting of their the, policies. Go ahead. The false notion of this is that you're going to create a government entity, which all companies now have to go through a federal government exchange. And by the way, when you say they can keep, let me finish, when you say they can keep their plan in this bill, it says after five years when the, exchange, the federally government mandated exchange is open, you can't even hire one person. You can't change the formulary of drugs of which you offer. You become ineligible and have to go to the federal exchange. Well, so it's clear in the bill you can't keep your insurance, that number one. That is not and true two, with regard to employers. Well, That's let me another just, one let me, of these let me wonderful fictions that my friends on the other no, side of the let table me are spreading around. You're, you're going to create a government company that takes federal taxpayer dollars to get started, also in the bill. That's not competition, number one. And number two, it doesn't pay payroll tax. It doesn't pay all of the same kinds of taxes that the private company does. And oh, by the way, it has to fit exactly what the federal no, government it, says it covers. No, that's not competition. No, 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 no. And that's why you the Lewin been, study says been, 114 million Michael, people you will must lose have been their sleeping. private health insurance. You must have been sleeping in the committee when we were dealing with oh, this. Oh, no, sir. I actually because, read the bill. That, because, that, that almost put me to sleep, except well, for I, the horrifying I, things I, in there. I, I, I wrote it. So I can sympathize with you. But the harsh fact of the matter is that the bill is a floor, not a ceiling. And it gives free choice to employers. They don't have to belong to it. The only folks who are going to be constrained by this are going to be the insurance companies. And, going to, and a lot of the things that they're doing now that people don't like, pre-existing conditions, uh, canceling your policy, other things like that, they won't be permitted to do yeah, And they'll have Conyers, to offer let me, let, let standard get, levels yeah, of benefits. Agree. Let me get to this point. Issues. Congressman Conyers, uh, Steny Hoyer said this past week that uh, the only way that he's on board with this plan is if it's paid for. The Congressional Budget Office in July took a look at, the, at the, what had come out of the House Ways and Means Committee at, the, at that point, where it, in, its, in its state such as it was, that it was going to add 200, over, over $200 billion to the federal deficit over 10 years, even if you'd added a half a trillion dollars in new taxes. Are you convinced that this that we can pay for this plan without either adding to the deficit or raising taxes on American people? Well, when you start uh, not continuing tax breaks for the wealthy, uh, we will get more money in. And that's what's been proposed by us. And that's what my friends on the other side have, have uh, been staunchly for making permanent uh, the tax breaks that Bush gave out and it has now caused the 44th president to inherit the largest deficit that when the Republicans started, the largest deficit since the Depression, to be precise. But, you know, you remind me, this discussion is so good because I pulled this out for the, just for this morning. Uh, open letter to engage voters. Some groups are spreading a tremendous amount of false information about the leading health reform legislation under consideration this is a letter by from the House. It's a letter from uh, the AFL-CIO uh, labor guys. This is, this is labor. Uh, and there's a Labor Day parade in a few days, which I hope to invite you to. Uh, labor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American I, College of Physicians. Uh, it's a lengthy list. I've got to get to a quick it's break. It's a very I, I lengthy list. I, I but, promise I'll give you a quick break. We do want to correct, correct some doing, right Can here. I just, in fairness, Devin, can I acquaint very the chairman quickly. of the Judiciary Committee with the concept of tort reform? Yes. It helps reduce costs in the health care system. That's in my jurisdiction. It's not in we'll the continue bill. with Flashpoint right after this on Local 4. Don't go away. Still so much to discuss. On the bright side, Congressman Conyers has already suggested we all get together on a future program in the very near future. I invite you all to do that. I invite you as well. Meet the Press is next. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Flashpoint.